Coming up on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. If they're a water management company, it's probably like flow rate modeling is really what they understand. They really don't care about the platform itself. They just care about that algorithm. What we're trying to do is if they get beyond a point that ThingSpeak can service them, maybe they can take that algorithm somewhere else to another IoT platform. They can take what they've invested in, you know, where the real IP or where their value comes from and maybe move it to other IoT platforms. If you've been listening to my show for a while, you know I'm a lover of IoT platforms. It just doesn't make sense to create your own plumbing from scratch, especially when there's so many beauties out there to choose from that support such nice business models, especially early on. But what about open source platforms? Are they ready for prime time? In this episode of the IoT Show, I speak with Han Scharler about where open source platforms are today and when it makes most sense to use them. All this and more on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. The people, the business, and the technology of the next generation internet. This is the IoT Inc. Business Show. And now, here's your host, Bruce Sinclair. Hello and welcome to the IoT Inc. Business Show. This show is made possible by sales of my book, IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, and the IoT Inc. Certified IoT Professional, or ICIP, online training and certification program. Become a certified IoT professional by completing the program's three courses, ICIP Technology, ICIP Business, and ICIP Strategy and Digital Transformation. Details of which can be found at www.iot-inc.com. That's www.iot-inc.com. With me today on the IoT Show is Hans Scharler. Hans is creator of ThingSpeak, an open source Internet of Things platform, and is currently a principal engineer at MathWorks, where he develops IoT technologies. Hans has over 15 years of experience as an entrepreneur, inventor, and consultant, and he even has a toaster connected to Twitter with over 2,000 followers. Hans, welcome to the show. Hi, Bruce. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, I got to ask, what's up with the toaster? <laughs> well, this is uh, when, uh, Twitter, <laughs> when Twitter was uh, first uh, announced. Um, I was uh, in this field of Internet of Things and thinking, uh-huh. thinking about what can I connect to, uh, to Twitter. And uh, I think the alliteration is what caught me first. So I was like, oh, a tweeting toaster or a toaster on okay. Twitter. <laughs> so it was very. So you're one of those guys. You're one of those guys that gave Twitter an early bad rep when they, you know, when they were complaining that people just tweeted what they ate. In your case, you even went beyond that. It was like how I'm making what I'm eating. Yeah. So I, I uh, rigged up, uh, rigged up a sensor that could detect whether the uh, toaster was on or not, and then. <laughs> Uh, hooked it up to my local network, and so I use their API to send if it's uh, if it's toasting or not, and that's all it ever says if it's uh, toasting or done toasting. And uh, so it was kind of a early project. So start toast and end toast is that it? Yeah, it's just toasting and done toasting is all it. Okay. It's all it ever says, and people like uh, favorite the tweets and retweet them and things like that. <laughs> but it's been going on since uh, 2008. So it was really <laughs> early on Twitter, and so. Uh, it, it kind of led to some of my ideas about, uh, you know, I tried to, you know, like you said, I was a bad, uh, <laughs> a bad person on Twitter in the early days. Yeah. So I was like, maybe that, maybe there is a place for our things to, uh, put these kind of messages. So that's where, How, that's where yeah, the early, what can I do? <laughs> what, what's the good thing I can do with this, uh, with this internet of things uh, exactly. and 2000 followers, these gotta be geeks, right? I mean, <laughs> who else is, <laughs> I mean, unless it's your mom, just making sure you're eating properly. <laughs> Yeah, it actually the, the idea kind of uh, turned into to many different uh, projects. So um, the natural twist that people put on it right away mm. was laundry mats, saying, "Okay, could you uh, could you send right. a message when uh, your laundry's done or when the dryer's done in, in the washer and all that?" So that's what like, the first twist on the idea that it happened, and that's when we started having ideas that maybe there's a a commercial side to this. What else could we monitor? And so that that was a fun 
that was a mm-hmm. fun start to all of this. Um, and that gave us a, the, the early momentum to keep, to keep going for the last eight years. So it all started with a tweeting toaster. Huh? Yep. It did. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, why don't you give us a little bit more background specifically? Well, it sounds like the toaster got you into it, but tell us a little bit about yourself and you know, your background in IoT. Yeah, so I, I have a, over 15 years uh, in this space. We didn't always call it Internet of Things, but uh, yeah. sometimes it was remote control and monitoring, M2M. I worked on uh, SCADA systems, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, I also worked on early network design for DSL networks in the United States. So I've been involved in the protocols, the networks, the testing of networks. Um, I've also, uh, on a s- side uh, area of this is just always been uh, training and advocating for just technology use. So okay. I got to travel the world uh, giving classes and talking about internet technologies um, for, for over 15 years. Now, in what capacity was that? With MathWorks, who you're with now, or was it in some other, with another company? Um, it was with another company. I, I recently joined MathWorks uh, as mm. a pr- principal engineer. And uh, you know, prior to that, I, I started a company um, and so it was for, it was for our own company, um, our own consulting company. And so okay. that's what led me around the world. Okay. Now, um, today what I'm going to want to talk about, uh, with you is uh, open source IOT platforms. And, and, um, so it sounds like you maybe, you maybe live a double life. Is it that you're working at MathWorks plus you're maintaining ThinkSpeak or how's that all working? Um, so we have a we have a close partnership uh, with MathWorks. So MathWorks is uh, definitely uh, um, pushing uh, the ThingSpeak technology and investing and in trying to mm, um, mm. you know keep the servers going and adding more capacity and uh, nice. adding features and things like that. So it ThingSpeak is an open source project, so companies and partners can jump in, and uh, that has happened in many in many cases. Well, why don't we start from the beginning? So. What is an, let's hear your definition of an IoT platform, and then what makes it what makes it different from an open source IoT platform? Okay, well the uh, that's that's a good question. Uh, what the definition of an IoT platform mm-hmm. is? Um, being so close to it, I don't know if I can get. I'm not. I don't know if I'm the best person to answer that question because uh, I hear everyone has an IoT platform, so I'm not. I'm not too sure what this it is. is true. <laughs> this is true. Um, I hear there's one started that even listens to toasters. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's there's probably one up starting right right now during this podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, but it it that's a that's a good sign that we're in a very active market where people are trying to develop these things. But our 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 purpose for developing uh, ThingSpeak or an IoT platform was that if you wanted to get started. That was kind of our definition. If you wanted to get started in something, what would you have to do? And we looked at all the things you'd have to do around your local area network or in your house or at your office. Mm-hmm. You'd have to set up servers and you'd have to set up a database and you'd have to get some kind of uh, middleware technology, decide if you're going to run Perl or Ruby on Rails or some new language or um, you know, try to set up a web, a web stack. And then you have to build a front end. And so a platform is to us was all of those things you would need uh, to get to get a device connected and also build an application for that device. So the device connectivity is one side, but if I want to see what that device is doing or integrate uh, that data with another platform, like connected to my Salesforce or connected to Oracle BI, there's mm. there's the application part. So we were trying to think of all those things you would have to do. And for us, that was what equaled a an Internet of Things platform or an IoT platform. Okay, okay, well, that's a good definition. And and so now, okay, now you you built it, you made it open source. What does that mean then? What's the difference between, let's say, an open source IoT platform? Maybe it's obvious, but I like to hear you know what you have to say. And a you know a for rent, for sale, or, or uh, for for lease uh, IoT platform. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I think there is a difference um, for sure. The the one the one thing that uh, was in our minds, and so 2008 uh, when we were starting to put this together, and uh, was obviously the open source hardware movement was happening in parallel to IoT. It wasn't even related mm. to IoT. So you had you had the things like Arduino's, right? So Arduino right. was 
putting out open source hardware designs, which is kind of a new, that was a new concept. Um, and when we first released, we put out uh, technology that worked with an Arduino, but we didn't think about the open source until it became obvious that the, the, the amount of momentum that open source hardware is having, there's nothing mm-hmm. that uh, pairs as at a platform or an application level that is also open source. Mm. And that was one of our, that was one of the things inside the back of our head. Also, uh, platforms were changing and, uh, you know, we're, we're all startups and we're all like, uh, you know, fly by night. So it, it's possible that we can close up shop. Uh, and so the open yeah. source idea was also that commitment that, um, if you pick us as someone to partner with, with IOT, um, even if we go away, there's, there's a plan B. Uh, right. And so that right. was because that's what the market was looking like in the early days of IoT. So 2008, 2009, 2010, um, companies were opening and closing. So this was our uh, essentially uh, like safety net for for the community that we were building. Sure. And um, so I mean, you you bring up a good point, and and this is one that uh, I when I work with my clients, it's always an issue. And it's why I'm I'm kind of seeking out the open source IoT open source um, information just to learn a little bit more about it because I think that is the biggest issue when a company does end up choosing a platform. And yes, I mean you can get off of it, but after a certain point in time, when you're beyond the sandbox, when you're getting into when you're actually getting into past the proof of concept and into a minimally viable product, there's a lot of investment that goes into the platform, and if it goes away. It's an issue. Now, of course, there are provisions you can make. You can make sure in the contract that you have the source code in escrow. As important, you've got the keys in escrow. But it's an issue, right? Are there any other? I mean, are there any other issues that you see uh, when you do go with a lease or a buy situation beyond making sure that you keep the source code in escrow as well as the as well as the different keys? So we, yeah, we've been involved with those kind of arrangements where we put source code in escrow and anything that's proprietary, and um, mm. that that typically works out, and that's usually enough for you know people to have that peace of mind or customers to have peace of mind. Um, the other option or the other reason for open source is there's so much being developed, um, and there's so many sensors and platforms and other things that are just going to keep popping up. They're not they're not going to go away, and to keep to say you're a development team that can keep up with every possible sensor or every format that a that a device could use or consume um, is kind of ridiculous. So you get this sure. multiplier effect if you do the open source project, uh, you know, well enough. Um, there's people contributing, and when new things come out, there's already source code or examples for those new things. Um, so the community can just jump right on them. So it helps. It helps broaden the story. No, I like that. Now, how are you attracting an ecosystem? And maybe you're not monetizing it, or I'll ask about that in a minute. But how are you attracting developers to actually put the time into your platform? That's a good question. So we are. We have just crossed over a hundred thousand developers on our platform. Okay. So okay. It's, it's growing. Uh, it's growing, and it's uh, been a vibrant community. I think the the two the two areas I can think of, and it may not just be two when I'm done <laughs> talking okay. about it, but the the things that we focused on is we visited a lot of uh, maker spaces um, and tried to uh, to see what people were building. Um, from our perspective, mm. the maker spaces were kind of the really the early adopters, the people that are tinkering, they're trying things out, they're making things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like with the Arduino. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. So we tried to to see what what some of the pain points were, some of the things that they were they were experiencing. Um, with that, we got early we got early customers, and so we started to see what was happening. Uh, you know, our first commercial customer was in 2009, and we got to see their their platform. It's been seven years. We're getting to see how they have evolved and how they've uh, made new business decisions because of interconnected devices, and how sensor data is changing their their business practices. So we're seeing it. We got to see it. Uh, you know, fortunate enough, we got to see both sides: how the makers were using it, how the commercial uh, mm. customers were using it. Um, so we kept trying to push. Um, so advocacy is one area that I'm 
I'm passionate about. So building the, the community, um, we always saw it as a ground up thing. We didn't see it as going to be some kind of big marketing plan. Um, so we went to the Open Hardware Summit um, in 2010. I think it was the first Open Hardware Summit. We went there. We were one of the mm-hmm. sponsors. Um, we set up a lot of demos. And um, another area that this is the second area, I guess that was all one. But the second area that we focused on was the uh, if, if something new, if a new open source hardware device was coming out, we tried to get a tutorial or an example ready um, as fast as we could. Um, an example of that that's been very successful in the IoT space is this this uh, this device called the ESP8266, um, mm. which is it's an open source device and it is three dollars and it's got a microcontroller and Wi-Fi. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So for three bucks, it's it's, <laughs> it's something uh, um, you could probably get it cheaper if you buy more than one of them. So it's pretty. It's it's a it's a big trend in the uh, the maker spaces and any commercial people are trying to uh, look at it differently. If, if, if something like that at retail cost cost $3, if you, if you had $3 and it was Wi-Fi and a microcontroller, what could you do with it? And when you look at it through that lens, not at mm-hmm. a $20 or $30 lens, when you start to look at it, that these, uh, you know, just maybe a dollar or two bill of materials, um, you can add it to a lot of things that you just couldn't have done that uh, maybe three years ago. So sure. that's a that's a big trend. And so one of the first projects you can do on an ESP8266 is send data to ThingSpeak. And so that's what attracted a, a community. Um, that happened to be one of the ones we um, uh, supported early. In you know early you know we took a made a bet on the ESP8266 and. It has worked out in the long run because that device is extremely popular. Okay, okay. So, so a few things I picked up from what you were saying. One, there's a lot of developers. Of those hundred thousand, how many are active? Do you think thirty thousand? So, okay, 30, which is still are, a huge number. Yeah, they're signing in and uh, sending data to us every day. That's huge. Okay, so there's thirty thousand. So you know, wow, there's lots of stuff that's happening. We have a lot of people banging on the code. Um, you're targeting the makers because, well, first of all, they don't have a lot of money. They're just tinkering around. So it would be good to have something, I guess, philosophically in line with the hardware that they're using. You're teaching and you're, you're trying to get it at every device. And then you've kind of landed on a pretty big one, the SP8. Was it the SP8266? Is that what you said? Exactly. Yeah. So we'll put that in the show notes. But you hit on a big one. And uh, with that cost, it gave a lot of visibility. So people are attracted uh, to this platform, mostly if they're makers, although I'm going to ask you about the attraction if uh, if they're not. And um, they like tinkering around. Now, you also mentioned, of course, that you've got commercial customers. And one of the things that attracts them is the open source issue that we talked about, is the breadth of, of um, I guess, uh, compatibility with different devices. What other things would attract a commercial player to an open source platform? So uh, I think... You know, engineers on a, in a in a large company. Um, mm. At heart, this is the things they try. Uh, you know, they're makers, they're tinkerers themselves. So True. we've had a lot of success when uh, maybe an engineering director is also doing kind of projects at home. They're doing Arduino projects. They're monitoring right. their washer and dryer. They're you know doing little little things at their house. Um, and when they see something like this, they may be able to build a prototype or a quick demonstration so they could uh they can advocate it around their company and show to show what's possible with some connectivity and and doing some data analysis on the data we're collecting from those things so if we can get enough demos and examples then um, that person becomes a little champion inside of that company um, cause what we're seeing is, is IOT is so broad. It's, it's multidisciplinary. It's a, it's a cell across many departments. Um, now CIOs and IT departments have to get involved. So it's a lot mm. of people you got to convince, um, mm. to, to make an investment in internet of things. So if you can see it, if you can, it's just not a PowerPoint slide with, uh, you know, there's going to be 50 billion devices by 2020 and, this is sure. what it's the impact to the the economy is going to be when you can actually see a product that that company makes work in a different way 
um, it starts to inspire that uh, maybe maybe we should take a look at this. So our our goal was to get a ton of those type of people, you know, building projects um, like those thirty thousand users. That a lot of them mm-hmm. work at companies. Mm-hmm. They're going to show off what they do, and someone maybe in marketing may pick up on that, and they're like, ah, oh, I wonder what we could do with that. Um, how could we? Because they have to go in and sell it across many different departments to get a decision to invest sure. in IoT. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So you're taking a grounds, I mean, a ground, a ground level approach uh, to to get into the enterprises, and then because they're using it and because they're demonstrated, it just makes sense. Well, let's continue on with it. Is that kind of the evolution? Exactly. Yeah, it, yeah. Let's uh, let's keep pushing forward. We lose customers at that point, right? They they may have developed their prototype, um, but mm. they go on to a different platform or make different choices. Sure. Um, and companies uh, are doing their own, right? They're writing, they're creating their own platforms. Uh, you know, servers are readily available with like uh, services like Azure and Amazon. Um, so people are are trying this out on them on on themselves, right? Building teams. Um, you know, setting up databases and, you know, how hard could it be? Right. So (laughs) we're, we're getting a mixture. Um, but we're, we're okay with that because we, you know, we're, we just wanted to be a part of the story. Maybe we planted the seed, maybe they'll come back, you know, when they realize the difficulties of scale or, you know, some of the bigger integration problems that may happen. Um, but, we're, I'm concerned particularly about the uh, future of IoT. I don't want it to be a, a thing that we remember. Hey, do you remember that IoT thing that everyone talked about a few years ago and now no one cares about? I'm more worried about that outcome than you know maybe losing a few <laughs> customers along the way um, that build nice big uh, IoT platforms. So that's, that's my and, end goal here. And so, but... To what end are you trying to prevent, you know, the, the history of IoT, you know, where it was like, oh, do you remember it? How are you, how are you preventing that? Well, I'm trying, to, I'm, I'm trying to build compelling projects. And I'm also, when I find compelling projects, I like to be their advocate, um, blog about them. I run, I run the uh, uh, blog at uh, ThingSpeak. I have my own personal blog about IoT. Um, and so I try to share their story. So I get very close to these developers okay. um, and try to, you know, push the things that I that I that I think are compelling that are also going to push the story along um, around IoT. No, that makes sense. So you're doing your part there just to, to keep pushing the boulder up the hill. Yep. Well, let's talk about um, what's involved now. What type of licensing agreement does a company need to sign or is there even one? So there um, right now. The um, if the all the source code is available on GitHub uh, mm-hmm. or ThingSpeak, and this gets you the uh, the API, and it also um, gets you the application to build uh, visualizations and things like that that are uh, related to your data that you're collecting with ThingSpeak. Okay. Um, that that's a, a GPL v3 license. Um, it's a it's a license you can, you know, use for uh, essentially non-commercial uh, uses. Um, and when uh, when a, a user gets a- across that point, then they usually contact us, and then we work we work with the customer directly to figure out some kind of relationship. Um, that's if you download the code through GitHub. Most users. Um, that are early experimenting. They don't want to set up a server and database and do an install of software. Um, they just sign up at thingspeak.com um, and they use it with the terms and conditions that they're presented with. And okay. that's where a lot of usage comes from. Um, once they get beyond that, maybe they uh, download it and fork it um, on GitHub and create variants of things speak and i'm aware of uh you know thousands of variants <laughs> of the source code so people are building out yeah. new features um adding new integrations and extending the platform so there's so many that i i can't wrap my head around on what everyone's doing with it at one point i knew kind of what was going on but now i, I don't i don't have yeah i don't have a no with thirty thousand developers i mean it's gonna be hard to keep track yeah. okay so this is an interesting thread now um so the GPLv3 gets you so far. 
What's generally then the business models and use your use things speak as an example, then generalize it to other open source IoT platforms. But what is the general business model that a user needs to well that that a provider of an open source platform like yours generally takes? So um, I can I can talk about it generally and I'll talk about uh, specifically to us. Um, it's it's usually uh, parallel services or parallel software, um, parallel features that are not necessarily available in the uh, in the open source or in the wild. So if you're gonna mm-hmm. if you're gonna build the scale, you need an enterprise version. That's that's where you start to look at other uh, other alternatives. So there might be the open source version, but an enterprise version, and we kind of fall into okay. that. Uh, to, to that category, we also have some parallel um, data science uh, software, uh, mm-hmm. which is called MATLAB, and MATLAB allows you to do some of the the more advanced analytics. So there's things called toolboxes. There's one toolbox called the Stats and Machine Learning Toolbox, and if you have a license for that, now you're able to do machine learning on ThingSpeak, and so that's uh, that's a for pay license for that tool mm-hmm. okay that's where some of the uh the, the parallel revenue comes from so offering different services and software that makes sense now the scalability this is one that's interesting so right now you're saying then with things speak they use it um they use it for their prototype you know their ideation all the way through their prototyping and then they're gonna have to make a decision after they get to some sort of a sometimes of a stage where they need to start talking about scalability and, and actually getting real customers on it. At that point, you're saying then they they need to leave the open source version or the free version and then jump on to the enterprise version. Am I understanding that correctly? And then maybe even upgrade the the analytics to the MathWorks um, license for the different toolboxes. Is that is that how it works for you guys? So it's it's a it's a little bit of all that. I guess it's it's fairly complicated. Uh, we don't go through the, the commercial process a lot. That's not what we're um, our our first focus has been the makers and uh, tinkerers. Uh, mm-hmm. We kind of handle them one one at a time and see what kind of relationship uh, works out. So we don't have a clean upgrade path at the moment. But what what we see is compelling is the. Uh, some of the proprietary algorithms or machine learning models and things like that, mm. that's what the mm. user, that's where their uh, maybe science or secret uh, sauce or their IP is really all about. So if they're, if they're a water management company, it's probably like flow rate modeling is really what they understand. Uh, sure. They really don't care about the platform itself. They just care about that algorithm. So what we're, what we're trying to do is if if they get beyond a point that ThingSpeak can service them, maybe they can take that algorithm somewhere else um, to another IoT platform. They can take mm. they can take mm. what the they've invested in, you know, where the real IP or where their value comes from, and maybe move it to uh, uh, other IoT platforms. And ThingSpeak was a way for them to develop that um, proprietary IP that sets them apart. You know, so if it's a okay. It's a car manufacturer that's you know got collision detection now or collision avoidance. That might be what their secret sauce is. But in order for them to ref- refine that model, they've needed an IoT connectivity platform to get the raw data to you know to enhance those models. Um, so they don't they don't see the IoT platform as the valuable part. They may see the algorithms and the the models uh, and the data analysis as the as the valuable part. No, and I agree. I mean, for listeners, everyone listening knows that I don't think the value is in the plumbing, so to speak. I mean, not that it's not valuable to use it, but for a company, that's not going to be their core. It's going to be very rare that that's their core competency. It's going to be part of their business. So they should be using a platform. They should not be reinventing a platform. But, you know, what I'm interested here, though, is I think what I'm hearing you say, and I don't want to generalize it, uh, what I think I hear you say is the open source platform, yours in particular, maybe in general, are good to get started. They're good to maybe develop that intellectual property that's going to be unique, and and I agree with that as well. But then at some point, you're most likely going to be pivoting away from the open source and looking at a commercial. Is that accurate uh, characterization? 
Uh, when you say we, what do you mean? I Well, um, so what I mean is um, a company, let's say an enterprise, so beyond a, beyond a tinker. So m- most of our listeners are enterprises okay. and they are, they are looking at what's the best way to, to build our IoT product. Now, I advocate all the time, don't build, but rent or buy a, an IoT platform. So, okay, so we're now we're on the IoT platform track. Now we've got this option, which is interesting, which is the open source option. And what I think I'm hearing you say is open source is good. It's really cheap, obviously. Um, you can you can test a lot of things with it. But at some point, you're probably going to need to to move to a um, a commercial platform of some form or another. Yeah. And I guess I'm just wondering, is that a fair characterization of where we are today with the op- with yours in particular, and in general with IoT? open source platforms. Okay. Yeah, I get, I get your question. That's a really good question, by the way. Um, and I think you're, I think you're actually summarizing where, not just where we are, but where IOT is in general, it's still mm. extremely early, um, in, you know, the evolution of how IOT is going. So I think you're right. I think, uh, once you get beyond the prototyping and tinkering and you're trying to figure out if this is going to be something your company invests in, um, you're going to have different needs once you get to a commercial product. If you're going to put this out into the marketplace, um, maybe for sale, or if you're going to, your business is now going to rely on uh, getting this kind of data, um, then you know you're going to have a different challenge here. You're going to have mm. uh, uh, you know uh, privacy policies. You're going to have to work out that you may not have had to work out before. Um, you are you going to have a tech support? Uh, you know, a help desk uh, added to your company is something you may not mm-hmm. have had before, taking inbound questions from customers. Billing. Uh, yeah, billing. And so it becomes a much bigger problem. Um, and we haven't uh, had enough time, even though I've been, you know, in this space for a long time. I don't think I've yeah. had enough time to know what all the commercial requirements are going to be. Mm. Um, so that's why I'm not... Uh, I haven't put out something that says, okay, this is the commercial thing that everyone needs. Um, right. We just haven't, we haven't get, got enough data and use cases to really understand that. But with that being said, we do have commercial partners. We're learning a lot together. Um, we're developing lots of uh, new technologies together, and that's you know part of my role at uh, MathWorks. And so I'm, I'm trying to learn those use cases and solve those pain points through um, keep it pushing and, and extending uh, what ThingSpeak is capable of doing. So at some point, maybe we'll have something that answers a, a, a more commercial system broadly. Um, but like I said, it's early, so I don't I don't have all the I, I don't have all the information that says mm. everyone's gonna. Here's what everyone needs. Yeah, no, 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 that's fair enough, and and I don't think anyone does at this point, to be honest. But there are commercial platforms out there. And the business models for commercial platforms are generally pretty easy to get into, you know, yeah. because they're going to be related on some metric, whether that's going to be data flowing or, or actions taken. And so I guess I'm looking for your advice when you're, let's say you are an enterprise and you're tinkering, you're at the beginning stage, but you, you know, you're that person that raised their hand and whether you're the one that's actually doing the tinkering or even now put together a, a small group that's doing the tinkering why decide then to go and start the process with an open source IoT platform versus a commercial IoT platform when the costs aren't the issue, right? Because initially, you're not going to have all those customers. You're not going to have all that data flowing. You're not going to be doing all those analytic actions. So so why would someone choose and, and put yourself in, you know, the from the perspective of an enterprise? Why would an enterprise choose... Use starting out with an open source platform versus a commercial platform. Okay, yeah, another great question. Um, <laughs> I really like this. The uh, so I, I I I can think of it from different perspectives. So if I'm if I'm in an engineering team, um, I may want to wrap my head around every every aspect of it while I'm prototyping. Right, um, and that that's that's the I might I might want to see what it looks like to have a database and install some software and, you know, kind of really understand it uh, mm, mm, instead mm. of having a, 
a black box and an API around the black box. And so, right. so from that perspective, okay. my, I may want to understand it, but, it, um, I have a lot of, you know, uh, customers that are in the marketing side. They're, they're not an engineer. Um, they like the idea that m they can sign up for something and, uh, build a dashboard without having to connect a device because there's an aspect of things speak where people can have public data and mm -hmm. what we call channels they can have public channels and so with a user account you can actually build a small application using someone else's data Interesting. Uh, you can't okay. control their things but you can use their data to create a visualization maybe mock it up so i when i'm talking to someone in a marketing group um, they like to be able to deal that they can try something out. So it's not necessarily that this may be the end all for them um, because there there may not be at that decision point yet, but now they can try it out. Um, mm -hmm. They also, when I talk to them, uh, I try to get them to think about um, what do they want to understand about their business? That's usually a question that you're going to hear from me if you talk to me long enough is yep. what do you want to understand? Um, because the previous question that I've heard before is, you know, what um, an engineering department may ask another team saying, okay, what data do you want to send to the cloud? What, right. um, and that's a different question. Absolutely. Um, so now I, what do I want to actually understand? So some companies have uh, warranty issues where they need to understand uh, if their product is used uh, correctly and if a warranty claim is a valid claim or not and if they could solve warranty fraud maybe that 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 changes their you know changes their bottom line or increases their profitability mm -hmm. because they want to understand warranty fraud um, or warranty usage of a product maybe they can go backwards and try to figure out what data they need to collect or what do they need to build to get there so depending on the audience i'm asking different questions and i try to see sure. i try to seed them with um, a, a different perspective. So engineers, they want to try some things out. Maybe someone from marketing or even someone that's just exploring it, maybe at an executive level. Uh, maybe they want to try to build an application uh, mm -hmm. to, to just to see what's going on because they've heard IoT so much that they know that they have to uh, do something about it, but they don't know what to do about it. And then, you know, trying to talk about, uh, talk to the information offer, the CIOs, the things like that, and just saying, what do you want to understand? Because, um, you know, this could inevitably just be an extension of an IT department um, at a company. And at some level, maybe it will be. The The physical aspect of the Internet of Things is probably going to be a part of IT at some point. Hmm. Um, but the information that gathers is going to probably be integrated into Salesforce or Oracle or some other kind of, uh, you know, business intelligence process at a company. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And, you know, everyone listening obviously knows, you know, my approach is what's the value you're trying to create that drives what information do you need to do you need to do you need to put together that drives what data do I need to collect that drives what's the tech I need to collect that data to create that information to create that value. And the example that you used the value was warranty fraud and just seeing, well, how do we how do we reduce it or eliminate it? So that all makes sense. But I think what I what I, I like what I'm hearing you say is again to that original question, hmm, you know, you're you're kind of scratching your chin and deciding what should I do next. You're saying the advantages of maybe starting with an open source platform are twofold. One is you can get down and dirty. If the engineers want to really open up the hood see how all the mechanics work, see how the underpinnings is put together, see how a platform, like you said, behind the API uh, works, so it gives them ideas, makes a lot of sense. They're not going to be able to do that with, with, ne with necessarily a commercial system. And the second one, I'm going to kind of paraphrase you a little bit because I think the sales guys can still do what you're, what you're saying or the exec can maybe, you know, maybe the, the product marketing guy can can put together uh, an app with someone else's data, with simulated data from sensors. You can do that in commercial. But what I like maybe maybe is like you don't have the hassle, right? Yeah. If I if I if I if I enter an agreement with a commercial company, and I just want to play around, you got a sales guy. You know, the sales guy is going to be calling on you. So I suppose, right? I mean, that that could be. I want to be incognito. 
uh, checking things out. That, that could be a lot of value. I want to lift the hood, really understand how this IoT platform thing works. Um, anything else you could add to that? Yeah, I, I think you're, you're making a, a good point about my uh, about the second paraphrase. Is just I, I don't know if I have a hundred percent answer for all those uh, for all those situations, um, but we're trying to we're trying to make it as easy as possible. Um, and like you said, other platforms are going to have a way to uh, create some visualizations and yeah. build a dashboard. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the, there's since there isn't necessarily a sales funnel, you're not going to be worried about. Uh, getting a follow-up call and things like that, like oh, what are you doing? You know, what, what, right. what's all this? Um, what's this all about? So you got to go. I believe very strongly you need to go through kind of a, a tinkering phase uh, mm-hmm. because you're going to put some of those concepts in your head, um, and it might it might be a month or two afterwards where you're going to be in a meeting and you're going to have that aha moment where you're going to connect sure. what you saw a few months ago to something a now a, a business problem, and you're going to go ah, I bet I could do this. Um, and I don't want you to make that decision quickly. I think it, the longer, you know, the more you can experience and then, you know, maybe a, a couple of weeks or a month goes by when you can tie it in later, then you know, it's really important. If you've forgotten about it, then you know that this wasn't as relevant as you thought it was in the beginning. But if mm-hmm, it keeps mm-hmm. coming up and you're like, oh, I could solve this problem that our business is facing, then maybe you'll, you'll come back to it. Uh, I'm just trying to see that initial uh, thought as easy as possible. Um, that way there's a chance, it might be a small chance that they come back mm. to us or, you know, they build a great IOT solution and put it out in the market. And now we can use that as an example of a success story instead of, you know, some failures and all the, the bad press around, you know, products that are uh, kind of missing the mark. Um, I'd rather have some great success stories than, than, you know, what's, uh, what's been going on in the last couple of years. No, no. I, I mean, I, I love your model. In fact, my previous company, GoGo6, um, that I was the CEO of, we had a sort of a similar. We had, we had a free IPv6 connectivity platform that people could use. We open source our client that people could modify, and they used it. And then when they got past the tinkering stage, they could then purchase our appliances and you know go to the next stage. So I, I like it, and it really... We had a similar kind of magnitude. We had about 100,000 uh, users awesome. of them. Probably around 30,000 were were regular users. So I really like it. I mean, I, I do like this model. Uh, I'm just, you know, again, trying just to, you know, so everyone listen, you know, to to what Hans is saying is that, you know, there's different ways to approach it and you can probably get there in the same way. But the open source, I think, I think, I think just being incognito and really digging deep you know, plays a certain and plays an important role. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, let, let's take a look at it from a slightly different way because because it just sort of reminded me with you when you have thirty thousand users or developers working on your platform, you're going to see some trends. And so I'm, I want to ask you a little bit about that. Like, what are you seeing right now? What's most popular? What's being done with your platform? What are the most popular things that are being done with your platform? Are you identifying any trends? Because wow, you've got you know you've got your finger on the pulse of a of a pretty big community. Yeah, that's a uh, yeah, that's a good point. Um, it's been really exciting to watch what's happened, uh, especially in the last year. Um, I'll, I would say market wise, the biggest trend is definitely uh, smart agriculture. <laughs> okay, uh, really across the board, this seems to be this is a what we would say is a mega trend. Um, wow. Okay. So, People are doing. You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just that's a that's a common. Uh, uh, you know, people are interested in what's going on with uh, their food sources and trying to replicate uh, environments, trying to um, build you know build a better uh, product at the end of this. But smart agriculture has been very popular. You can change. Wow. You can change so many aspects of the process on water yeah, water yeah. utilization. Um, the, uh, nutrients. the nutrients, the, the, uh, uh, the grow stations or greenhouses and how you control wavelengths of light, optimize Genetic all those seeds. I mean, yeah. So right. s- smart agriculture is, is definitely a big trend. Um, we have such a wide array of, uh, users on things speak. Uh, mm-hmm. we've seen everything from, uh, someone that has instrumented a, uh, 
a uh, a squirrel feeder in their backyard, um, <laughs> all the way up to a uh, a country filled with radiation sensors, um, trying to detect you know radiation trends and currents and things like that. So we've right. seen we've seen the uh, we've seen the spectrum um, of usage. Um, the squirrel one is very is, was, was a very popular project over this last summer in uh, 2016. Is just um, they're trying to make a prediction on how long the weather, how long the winter is going to be based on how many nuts are being taken from a, from a feeder. <laughs> no uh, kidding. Okay. So, but it's an interesting thing. They were able to instrument a feeder, measure how many nuts are being taken out and they're doing some analysis to, to figure out if there's any correlation. Um, then, like I said, uh, the, the country of Poland in Europe is completely instrumented with weather stations and radiation uh, detectors all around the country. Uh, and they've built a countrywide project to open source all of that data they've collected from weather stations and radiation monitoring sites all around the country. Um, and in fact, in, you know, in terms of the countries that use ThingSpeak, uh, Poland's in our top five countries, which you know, no are sending hmm. lots of traffic to us. Uh, or lots of data to us. They're doing lots of projects. Um, there's also like a kind of a coordinated effect where they're they're trying to build these things uh, in parallel with each other. So maker spaces and fab labs are all getting together and and building these uh, radiation sensors and weather stations um, across an entire country. So that's wow. you know. So I'm seeing the I'm seeing the spectrum of projects. Yeah, no, it sounds like it. And you mentioned top five. I'm curious, what are, what are the top five countries that are that are doing IoT projects? Uh, yeah, so this is based on uh, ThingSpeak data. Sure, uh, sure. United States. It's a pretty big data set. Yeah, though. it's a pretty big data set. Yeah, so we're doing billions of uh, uh, pieces of data a year. Um, okay. So okay. we're so we're getting we're getting quite a bit of uh, traction in uh, in the United States as a country. The U.S. comes in at number one. Okay. Um, the interesting surprise and the thing that uh, it's not really a surprise, but it's a trend that has changed in the last two years is India is now number two. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. And they they essentially are 10 percent of the things speak traffic, um, which is wow. amazing. And two years yeah. ago, they weren't even in the top 10. Um, so that that's been an amazing trend is to see uh, what India has done. Uh, Germany, England and Poland um, are the remaining uh, the remaining countries. Um, okay. If you add up all the countries of Europe, um, they would be number one overall. So Europe is definitely uh, definitely heavily invested in uh, in IoT, and there's a lot more activity coming out of Europe as a base than versus the United States. Uh, now, are we including uh, England in Europe? I was, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I'm interested. What's the back end? You mentioned the back end earlier. You mentioned you have math um, MathWorks that's obviously helping you with that back end. What is what is the back end that's required to support these billions of messages of yours? How many servers? Where are they? Can you just give us a bit of an idea of your of your architecture? Yeah, our, our hosting partner is Amazon. So oh, it is Amazon. On okay, AWS. So we have uh, we built out our our platform on Amazon worldwide. Um, so we have, uh, um, I think, I think at this point, I mean, we're turning the servers all the time and adding to our load balancer and things like that, but we're over 30 different servers that are involved in, uh, managing this across the world. And is it private information or do you know how much is this costing you per month? Let's say I actually don't know that cost anymore. I used to be very close to that cost, but, uh, I'm not sure what that is. Yeah, no, I'm just wondering, again, just to give people an idea, if they were to use AWS and they were to have 30,000 active users, you know, are we talking 5000 a month? Are we talking $5 a month? I would 50, think you're, a month? you're in the five to $10,000 a month area. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And everybody knows, you know, that I'm a big proponent of Internet products or Internet of Things product, and I contrast them with connected products and with... Um, smart products. So, Hans, are you seeing much much going on? And you mentioned a couple of them, but are you seeing much going on beyond simple connectivity? You know, pet peeve of mine, and heck, you know, I was doing this eight years ago with my company, where it's just connectivity. You're just connecting to something. 
yeah. really an Internet of Things product goes beyond that. It brings to bear the whole value of the Internet, not just its connectivity characteristics. So how much is analytics getting involved? How much? You mentioned, you mentioned application development environments. You mentioned a little bit about models. But those, in my view, as everyone knows, are the, what I consider the trinity of value. There's the model, the app, and the analytics. How many projects are you seeing that have evolved beyond simply the smart or the connected product? So that's a, that's a good point to make, um, is that there's kind of a workflow that uh, a developer may go through. So it always mm-hmm. starts with connectivity. And that's like sure. the first thing they gotta they gotta check that box or you know they they it's the basis of everything else. So yep. getting connectivity right is is a is a big deal. And for hobbyists, um, a great platform to kind of get started in this space is like the uh, the particle uh, particle dot io and their devices, the photon mm. electron, it makes it really easy to kind of get the connectivity uh, out of the box. Um, and you can deploy some of the apps through you know, write your software through a web browser, which is really nice to get started. Um, so connectivity is one. Um, and then a portion of those users don't get past, you know, get, they don't get past connectivity. They, sure. that's kind of where it ends. They, maybe they release a product that is just essentially a remote control device. Like I, if I make a thermostat and then I add connectivity to it and now I just allow you to control it from your phone, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Command to control, type scenario that's not really iot at that point it's just you're extending the you getting closer yeah you're yeah. getting closer but you're just extending the ui to somewhere that is someone remote uh somewhere else a portion of users then uh, maybe develop something beyond that once they start to understand what what do they really want to understand about the thing they're making then that's where a portion become they get into the data science part they're trying to understand you know what can they do with the data and they realize that the the value becomes in if I can do this, if I can cover a whole area with thermostats that are connected, mm-hmm. I I start to get this uh, multiplier effect, and I start to understand if I know if I know the temperature set point of every thermostat in an area in a concentrated area, I have an indicator of what the power usage is going to be for that neighborhood. Right, and you start to you start to get a multiplier effect once once you get Absolutely. once you get beyond one. Um, so that's one thing, and then you get a portion of users that can take advantage of that and take advantage of the of the connectivity and start tying weather weather data into it. So if I right. keep running on the thermostat example, so the weather is going to determine you know the thermal properties of a house. You know if how Absolutely. how uh, if it's really hot outside, well then I don't need to heat the house, right? I <laughs> I don't because the outside temperature is going to increase the temperature in the house. I can sure. use those things like that to optimize um, my traditional uh, thermostat. So those companies that are starting to take advantage of it that it, that it is internet connected now can use the weather to get uh, to get the uh, the house ready. Um, you can go further. You can say, is the house occupied or not? Uh, where's the location of all the people who live in the house? If they're not, mm-hmm. if they're not all home, do I have to be running the air conditioner now? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so, in, like I said, the smart agriculture is a trend. What we're seeing as well as uh, the efficient use of water is is really what what the at the heart of the agriculture problem is. Mm, okay. So, if you can use weather data and the chance of rain to determine do i need to irrigate today if the chance of rain is above 70 percent um maybe i don't need to irrigate today and so they can create you know mathematical models around that and say well maybe i can use less water so things that start to take advantage of the fact that they're interconnected you get the multiplier effect and then you get the multiple data sets and the can you make correlations to weather and location and the environmental uh situations um and that's where i start to see the real value of iot come come through hallelujah no i like the way you frame it i like that evolution so hans you've got again you know with this with this pulse on the market what percentage would you say of the projects are actually using data science uh, roughly i would say roughly right now it, it's less than 10 percent. so it's probably in between uh you know six to eight percent 
uh, okay. mark. Okay. That's yep. where. Yep. yep. Um, that's where I see it. And how are you measuring that? How you? I mean, I know six eight is you're spitballing a bit, but how are you getting to that data? I'm getting. I'm measure? getting that data because we we track it very closely. We we try to understand our users um, and what the trends are. Um, mm-hmm. But we also, uh, you know, we've made available in the last year. We've we've made available on ThingSpeak for free. We've added MATLAB analysis and MATLAB nice. visualizations nice. Um, to this audience. So we know the type of people, uh, or, or we know the the types of things that are are going. So they've had this hammer for a year, and they've only had it for a year. So we're starting to see what they're doing. Mm-hmm. We're creating really mm-hmm. interesting things that um, that we didn't expect them to do um so we just we just saw a a solar water heating project where um they're using matlab to determine whether or not uh when to cycle the water through the heating element and the storage of the water they're trying to find that exact time they should make that handoff because if you do it too early or too late um your water may cool down you know the sun may go away and if you put cold water into warm water you lower the temperature but there's an optimal time of doing it and it takes some data science to figure that out and to optimize yeah. that process um, so it's only been a year since we've had matlab integrated and available for free um, so that's why i'm i'm saying it you know i know of about six thousand active users that are using nice every- nice 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 oh well, excellent well excellent information very useful and i really appreciate your perspective hans where can people find out more about you and uh, your organizations so i'm i am active on uh twitter i i blog a lot about iot so if you follow me uh on twitter at charler which is s-c-h-a-r-l-e-r and uh that you'll see you'll see my tweets and sometimes you know i'll tweet about the, the latest IOT protocols and sometimes I you know I try to be funny um, <laughs> uh, with with what I'm posting um, that's what I do you know I, I'll do that uh, on my uh, personal blog and things like sure that. Um, but uh, thingspeak which is where I'm actively uh, participating um, is at thingspeak or thingspeak.com um, we have a community we have a forum we keep a blog um, the blog is about the latest uh, projects and trends. Um, mm-hmm. I recently blogged about the top countries, which was our, most, <laughs> you did? Okay. yeah, it was about our, it was essentially the most popular blog post that we've, uh, we had this oh. year. Um, a lot of people okay. shared it on LinkedIn and try to, you know, get the word out about it. Um, but yeah, so I'm active, uh, you know, I share the projects that, uh, are public on things speak. Um, you know, people have taken photos of their project and shared it. On, Fun. And I, you know, so people can see what our community is doing. Fun, fun. And MathWorks, are we going to, I'll put all this, I'll put all this in the show notes, including the toaster, but um, MathWorks, is that, you want to put out a shout out there too? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, MathWorks um, makes a, a product called MATLAB, and MATLAB is uh, definitely for data analysis, data analytics. Um, that's available uh, via ThingSpeak for free. Uh, so you, mm-hmm. you can write MATLAB analysis scripts and code um, and run it uh, on the cloud. You don't have to have a desktop license, things like that. So it's a that's a pretty amazing uh, partnership. Um, MathWorks also has a software application called Simulink. And Simulink is how you can uh, target a device. Uh, you, can, you can model it in software and then output the code so you can create the device. Um, so this is used in the automotive industry and, uh, NASA as a customer. And so a lot mm-hmm. of those, mm-hmm. a lot of those navigation algorithms come from a Simulink model. And then, uh, the code, uh, you get modeled up in a virtual environment and then output the code to an onboard computer on a, on a car or on a system. Yeah, no, and that's. And that's the action. I mean, I call that the software-defined product. Sometimes it's referred to as the digital twin, but um, but that's that's where the action is, and that is in the modeling. And we, everyone knows we've talked about that before. But I, it's, it's interesting because I I know about MathLab obviously for a long time. I didn't know that they were playing in the data analytics space, so that's kind of new information to me. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. 
And um, one other clarification, you said you can use it for free, and then earlier you said there's a licensing fee. Was that for visualization versus this Simulink, or, or what's the difference? So all those in the all those products are, are separate. So ThingSpeak is for free. Um, you get access to MATLAB via ThingSpeak for free. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But if you want to take that further, uh, MathWorks has toolboxes that are uh, called like the Stats and Machine Learning Toolbox. Uh, yes. In order to use machine learning on ThingSpeak, you'd have to have a license for the machine learning toolbox. And that's okay. available through MathWorks. And the machine learning would be not the Simulink then? So it's part of helping build the model in Simulink? Or how, what's the relationship between the machine learning and Simulink? So Simulink is, uh, there. there is definitely a relationship. It might be very complicated to, to really purely uh, define it, but Simulink, I, I like to think of it as targeting the device and the algorithm that's going to run on the device. Uh, okay. So I'd model it up in Simulink and then uh, execute or output the code for the device that I'm going to program. There's even Simulink uh, blocks and Simulink packages that will target an Arduino and Raspberry Pi. So you don't have to have like a proprietary computer or anything like that to to run. You can. We've what we've done with it is we've we modeled up a, a car counter um, that takes an image from a webcam that's hooked up mm. to a Raspberry Pi, and we modeled up the, the, the feature detection from the images that are coming off the webcam to detect mm. if it's a car and detect if, what direction the car is going. And so we have a camera facing a highway, and we're able to count the number of cars that are going by. <laughs> but all the, the counting is done on the Raspberry Pi, but we modeled it up using Simulink. So Simulink was our, our way of uh, defining on you know what this blob is and counting this but not counting that. Um, and so we did all of that modeling on Simulink, and Simulink ex exported the code uh, Got available. It. Now where MATLAB came in is now MATLAB is running on ThingSpeak, and so that Raspberry Pi is sending the raw count of cars to ThingSpeak. Mm. And... On ThingSpeak, we, we write a MATLAB code that uh, aggregates it into how many cars went uh, in a certain hour. And this is where the data analysis starts to come into. That's mm -hmm, where MATLAB mm -hmm. starts to shine. Mm -hmm. So we say, and then you can use MATLAB to say uh, what the peaks were, right? So find the peaks in the traffic. Now that we've added it all up across the day, okay, now we have peaks, you know, obviously mm -hmm, in the morning. Mm -hmm. We have peaks of cars in the after work. Um, and now you can create a predictive model and say, what's it going to be tomorrow based on all this historical data? And that's where MATLAB uh, comes in. Got it, got it. So the machine learning then is helping create these models effectively. Right, exactly. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Hans. I appreciate it, and uh, we'll be talking soon. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks for having me. Okay, that's a good talk with Hans Scharler. This podcast goes vertical, deep diving into different topics each week. If you prefer a more horizontal and structured approach to learning IoT business and its orbiting technologies, check out my book, IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, or become a certified IoT professional by completing the ICIP training and certification program. For details, just go to www.iot-inc.com. Also go to www.iot-inc.com for an analysis of this episode, links to things that were mentioned during the episode, and very importantly, the episode's PDF transcript. Just search for the name of the episode or the guest. If you're new to this podcast, subscribe. That way you'll get every week's episode delivered straight to your device. Or if you've been listening for a while, there are three ways you can support the show. You can leave a rating or a review on iTunes. Just go to iot-inc.com slash iTunes. It only takes one click to leave a rating, a little bit longer to leave a review. You can share it on social. I'm on LinkedIn, to a lesser extent, on Twitter. And of course, you can support the show by buying my book, IoT Inc., or the ICIP Training and Certification Program. That's how I pay the bills. Next week's episode is IoT Retail Tech Converging Offline and Online Shopping with Uleg Pazanov. I hope you can join me then. 
I'm your host, Bruce Sinclair. Thank you for listening. Until next week, may your path to IoT business be an open one. You have been listening to the IoT Inc. Business Show. 